Dinobot! Whoa! Yeah, I can continue or look at all the adventure books of mine from years and years ago when I was a wee little whippersnapper. We've got Transformers Adventure Key Books again, this time Dinobot War. With everybody's favourite Dinobot, Grimlock, in his T-Rex mode, taking on a uh, Triceratops for some reason. And various different winged dinosaurs flying in the background, of course. Nowadays, we're pretty much convinced that dinosaurs had feathers. So the whole leathery skin kind of look might be completely inaccurate, but... Oh, the things we learn on a day-by-day -day basis. Let's take a look, quick look at the back. Uh, same blue as there has always been in the past. This time, with the help of secret devices found on an ancient flying saucer, you could travel back to prehistoric times and help the heroic Diabots in a battle against the evil Decepticons if you dare. Hmm, if you collect Transformers, this book is for you. And I've got to say, say, I really do like the front of uh, this book. The artwork does look quite nice. It is, it is something that, you know, despite the very toyatic look on Grimlock's uh, character model there, and that is pretty much exactly what it's uh, toy looked like in dino mode. It is something that if it was, you know, remove the logos and everything, if you just had, you know, say that much of the paint painting up on your wall, blown up bigger, that would look quite nice. Now let's take a look. Another advert for the UK comic, same blurb on the front again. Ooh, this time around, just take a look at here. The only the book noted is Peril from the Stores. Hmm, this must have been a, uh, an earlier book than uh, some of the others. Except that it mentions that it was first published in 85 and then reprinted in 86. So this is the 86 reprinting, so it obviously got, you know, at least two imprintations, but, oh well. Let's see where we are. <clears throat> you are on your first visit to Disneyland in California. Ooh. In a single morning, you have sailed safely past a pirate battle in the Spanish Main, crept nervously through a ghost-infested mansion, taken a trip on an old paddle steamer, and plunged on a breakneck ride through a mountain. Now you're riding on a train that twists and ro- Now you're on- Now you're riding a train that twists and winds its way through Disneyland. You find yourself passing scenes of prehistoric times where animated models of giant reptiles clash gorily. As you get down from the train, you decide to look for a hot dog stand. Then you notice some kind of disturbance up ahead. Security guards and police are moving people away from a barrier. Beyond the barrier, you can see signs advertising new attraction now under construction. Star Wars Land. You wonder why the crowds are being moved away, and you decide to investigate, because you're a nosy little so-and-so. If you try to sneak past the barrier, turn to page three. If you climb into the electrically powered buggy near and try to drive past the guards, turn to page two. Let's go GTA. And as you can see there, there's a very angry guard looking at you on page three behind what is presumably meant to be uh, the castle, Snow White's castle in there, whichever version of Disneyland you go to. You clamber into the buggy. It is a symbol vehicle which goes at walking speed used by Disney staff to cruise the streets. Wow, a walkman? My god, this is so 80s, even though it's the early 90s. Wait, no, hang on, it was 80 something, wasn't it? Uh, publishing date 85. See, my memory retention is terrible. Yeah, a Walkman. For those that don't know, for those that were born well before the Walkman demised uh, and went off into obsolution, obsolution, one of those versions of the word, I suppose, a Walkman basically played tapes, old cassette tapes, and that would either play music to you or audio books of the time, or even in some cases, uh, recordings of uh, radio plays and stuff like that. Or, if you were really, really cheap, and you didn't want to buy the music, you would just record the chart show and uh, if, listen back to us at a later date. Anyhow, a walkman rests on the seat next to you, you glance at the cassette in it, Cats, the soundtrack from the musical. <laughs> There was also that. Looking across the controls of the buggy, you find them simple enough. You press a button and the motor pours, pours, the motor purrs quietly. If you wish to leave the Walkman here, turn to page three. If you keep the Walkman with you as you drive past the barrier, turn to page four. Well, we can guess what's gonna happen on page three, so let's go to page four. The little buggy trundles slowly towards the guards as you approach them. Your nerve begins to fail. You are sure they will stop you, but then you are on the far side of the barrier and driving towards the new attraction. Amazingly, it is as if though the guards don't even see you. 
and must have worked for Group 4. The new exhibit, The Wizard's Cave, is at the end of the street. No one is about, but you can see power cables running into the cave mouth and it's obvious that people are working inside. You stop the buggy outside Droid Hunter and traction that is closed for repair. Do you want to go in Droid Hunter? Do you want to go to the Wizard's Cave? Well, given Droid Hunter is right here, let's not go there, let's go to the Wizard's Cave. And oh look, page 7, the end. You can do nothing to save yourself and this is the end, that means you die. Uh, page, oh look, Ravage. I didn't actually bother reading who you were supposed to be fighting here. That's because it didn't tell me. But that's Ravage, so that tells me that potentially Soundwave might show up, because Soundwave is his daddy. Funny, funnily enough. I think I can get, guess as exactly why Cats the Musical was in the Walkman. Because Ravage transformed into a cassette tape. So there was a reason for that Walkman being there. To give Ravage a place to hide, because he would transform into a cassette, shrinking into cassette size as he did, otherwise he was a standard size big cat. Uh, yeah, the Decepticon's master spy. Didn't talk much in most continuities, but there you go. And I gotta say, I like that artwork. That is quite good. That's easily one of the best I've seen so far in this book. <laughs> but then again, it's the only one that's actually shown me anything of the uh, Transformers in this book. You decide to take a look at the Wizard's Cave instead. You enter a tunnel strung with spotlights. Sturdy wooden posts hold up the roof and walls. The Wizard's Cave is due to open in only a few weeks. And yet there's no sign of the bustling activity you would expect. Why has work stopped? You hear voices ahead and tiptoe towards them. Turn to page 13, which is over here. Oh, look, there's an old woman with an umbrella taken on and out a security guard. Oh, excuse me. It's <coughs> like H of the belch, and I don't know why. All right. What have we got here? A few workmen and security guards are standing by while five men in suits talk intently. Your gaze travels around the chamber. You see plans and chart guidelines for the layout of the wizard's cave, but it seems that work has stopped. The five suited men are obviously in charge here. One of them, a thin man wearing thick spectacles, is holding a huge device that looks like a heavy rifle. He's talking to the others about it, and if you strain your ears, you can just about catch what they're saying. Now, I'm going to stop there, because that's obviously the, the man on that page there, and that looks like he's shooting at something and suspended in mid end perhaps? Possibly. Again, very good. The artwork is always excellent when it comes to the human characters. Okay, and it can be a bit hit and miss with the Transformers themselves, but obviously the artist knows exactly what they're doing when it comes to, to people. So maybe robots weren't really something they had much experience with. But in my personal opinion, when I've been drawn, I always find it easier to do robots than to do people. Simply because angles are a lot easier than organic lines. And here you can see a couple of security guards and Ravage. Ravage looking not as good as he did in that picture. I mean, look at the level of detail. Oh wait, hang on, maybe that isn't... No, hang on, there's absolutely no indication there that that is supposed to be Ravage. So that is actually... No, I'll tell you why it is actually Ravage. Because it mentions its weakness. You're almost paralysed with fright, but you manage to raise the laser rifle. Your attack is directly in front of you as you pull the trigger. Normally the laser beams of these rifles are quite harmless, but at such close range they can be dazzling. The creature must be sensitive to bright light. You hear it whine in pain and rage and then scurry off. And Ravage was vulnerable to bright lights. Shine bright lights in its eyes and he was as good as crippled, but you take a look at that. I mean, they've got his, one of his hip rocket launchers there. You can't see the other one, although the angle might obscure it a bit, and it looks like everything's been distorted through time. But look at the level of detail in comparison. That is just a sudden drastic decrease in quality there. And there's Grimlock looking... Um, I'm sorry, but that is a terrible... Terrible rendition of Grimlock. I, uh, I know he's. I know the obs I know the artist is obviously using the toys themselves as a more sort of direct comparison, or at least you know probably looking at the catalogue uh, that would have been out at the time and looking at the what you could see of the toys there. But jeez, come on, use a little bit of artistic license to actually make it look good. That is just terrible. Or maybe it was just rushed for that one, I don't know. It just, ugh. 
Check out. Oh, there's sludge. And there's somebody else in the background there. That's a better looking picture, but it's still not that good. It's a bit more organic looking than the actual toy would have looked, but uh, yeah. Sludge, the big dumb one. So let's just keep taking a look here. And there's everybody's favorite flame induced uh, psychopath. Sludge. No, wait. Sludge was the one that's just came up here. Why am I saying the name wrong? Oh, that could be because Mo uh, Hasbro has decided to rename this guy. Uh, his original name was Slag because of his fire breathing ability to melt other robots into molten metal, aka Slag. Now, more recently, the execs at uh, Hasbro have finally found out that the word Slag in the UK has the same connotations as Slut. Yeah. Thing is, though, the terms slut and slag have had the same sort of meaning for the better part of a century, as far as I'm aware. So, long before the Transformers were a sporting, uh, sporting glint in some executives' eyes, you know, and slug was considered the better name for slag. I don't know, it's just. It's ridiculous. Call him slag. He was slag at this time, so I'm just going to continue referring to him as slag, and as such. You know, even when I see Slug in any capacity, if it's a Triceratops and he breathes fire, his name's really Slag. And it doesn't mean that he's a Slug, it just means he's a psychopath who will gladly melt things down with his flame breath. Now Grimlock could also do the same thing, but he's uh, here roughhousing with Ravage. And this is showing tremendous, tremendous balls, so to speak. Tremendous ball bearings on the part of Ravage because he's tiny. Grimlock is one of the larger of the regular size of Autobots, so to speak, and one of the most powerful of the Autobots, full stop. Um, whereas Ravage is, you know, at best he could do assassination work, but he's mostly designed for spying and infiltration. And it looks like he's only got one of his rocket launchers here. He's in the cartoons and the comics. If he had rockets at all, he always had two, unless he had shot one off. So I'm assuming that he's fired one off at some point. Now, yeah, well. <clears throat> Which may never know. Let's just see. Oh, Swoop, my personal favourite. Uh, what was he transformed into? Because you can't really tell from that. Looks like a giant metal bird, but in reality it was a pterodactyl, wasn't it? Yeah. And that is the worst looking of all of them. Yeah, I mean, why does he seem to have these bits here coming out? Those should be solid with the rest of his wings. That just makes no sense at all. Yeah, it's uh, hmm. Oh, and he's ravaged with both missiles. So this must be very early on before he's had to shoot somebody. And here he is, but yeah, he is ravaged up against a saber toothed tiger. Um, yeah, although bizarrely, that's on the same page as a page where you die at his mouth. But it's actually to do with the text here, because that's talking about the saber tooth noticing. Not realising that he's a robot, because let's face it, this is a prehistoric creature and he would have no idea what a robot is. Even modern day tigers would have no idea what a tiger, uh, what a robot is. I think the modern day, uh, a modern day tiger would know what a tiger is, although they might have a different name for themselves. And here is Decepticon fan favourite Laserbeak. Or is it Buzzsaw? That's just, yes, it's Laserbeak. Come to the text, it's Laserbeak. Now, he was an, effectively one of Ravage's brothers. There was a series of cassette tapes that all came out of the chess compartment of Soundwave, who is a, another fan favourite. Even though he's a bad guy, he's one of the best bad guys going. And some continuities, he had minor telepathic abilities. So he could read the minds of other robots. And in some circumstances, he could also read the minds of humans. Um, but he transformed into a cassette player and he could store all of his cassettes which would be Laserbeak and his twin brother Buzzsaw, Rumble and Frenzy who were also twins and Ravage, later Ratpat who was another flying uh, robot like Laserbeak and uh, Buzzsaw were but he transformed from a tape into a bat-like creature that just sort of old school resembled a rat. So there was obviously some bad joke there, and the character wasn't exactly popular as far as I'm aware. But of all of all the characters, Ratban actually became a Decepticon leader. Yeah. Uh, Bob Bedansky must have been smoking something to come up with that idea. 
You go from Megatron and Soundwave to Rotback when you've got something like Soundwave on hand. Oh look! Aliens! Somebody called the Doctor. They're messing with the timeline. And that's a flying saucer and my god, what the hell? Seriously, what the hell? They look like... They look like duck creatures that have sort of partly smashed their way out of their eggs but not bothered to go any further. Oof. That does not look practical in any way, shape or form. How does anything like that actually evolve to the point where they can actually build something? Oh look! It's Laser Beacon Buzzsaw. Uh, la laser Beacon Buzzsaw. Laser Beacon Ravage. Brothers in Arms jumping at something. That could actually make quite a nice dramatic uh, poster in its own right. If it was just drawn a smidge better, as well as coloured. Maybe if it was coloured in, it would look better. Okay, but yeah, who knows. I think that's possibly the last of the pictures. Yes, that's the last of the pictures. And after that, we've got all the usual adverts for TR Bear and all the children's news like the stuff that you could apply for back in the day. So, here we go. That is still an interesting book. I mean, I can't really, I can't really go into too much detail because I don't want to give spoilers away. It's basically, as I've said before, it's the Transformers answers to choose your own adventure. As such, it is quite good, okay? Dave Morris knows exactly what he's doing. He's written this very, very well. Okay, the only real problems that I have with this kind of book and choose your own adventures in general is, of course, all the wasted space. Okay, if they just use the paragraph system that had been in use, both these books and the choose your own adventures, if they had used the paragraph system that had been in use in other uh, book systems, they could have saved so much space and possibly even uh, came up with even more story, gotten more bang for your book, so to speak. But what you get, and at the time this was £1.50, so, you know, that was an absolute bargain in that regard. So I can't really complain about that, and nowadays that would probably be about £4.50, maybe £5 even, but, uh, ah, well, who knows. I'm going to leave it there. Let me know your thoughts below, and maybe you have seen more books than this. Maybe there are others. I know I've got four, okay, and you'll be able to see all four of them in due course once I've reviewed all of them, but uh, for the time being, I think I'm going to say bye-bye.